you're here, you. and God bless you, my dear Thank brother. Thank you very much, Brother Lindsay. As I was coming in just a few moments ago, Billy, my son, told me that I believe that Sam Jones was the evangelist. Is that right? Sam Jones called that worked with Sam Jones. Lived here. So this spot must be kind of in a sacred spot, but a, a spot dedicated to the Lord. And we have built a building on top of this holy place. And this morning we are here for a dedication of this building to the God who has protected it and brought all these things to pass. And it's always a great pleasure to me to, and a privilege to speak a few words concerning and a dedication of the church to the service of the Lord. Now the church is just a building. But it was said once that by Stephen's, he said, Solomon built him a house. But how be it the most high dwelleth not in the houses made with hands, but a body has thou prepared me. See? And we know that the church is the, the spirit of God in the people, makes the church. But we also have places, our gathering places, dedicated where the, this church body gathers together to worship God. And God has given to our precious brother and to this congregation this most beautiful structure. Therefore, we are here this morning for that purpose to dedicate it to be a place of worship to the Lord our God. I'm going to ask that this pastor, to have a part in this dedication, to read out of the Bible Second Chronicles, the fifth chapter, before we have the dedicational service. Second Chronicles 5, Brother Littlefield. My eyes are a little blurry today. We've done a little weeping round here, but I'll do our best to read. Thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in all the things that David his father had dedicated and the silver and the gold and the instruments put he among the treasure of the house of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, out of Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant out of the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Wherefore all the men of Israel assembled themselves under the king in the feast which was in the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. And they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the holy vessels, and were in the tabernacle. These did the priest and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen, which could not be told, nor numbered for, for multitude. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, to the oracles of the house, into the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. For the cherubims spread forth their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark, and the staves thereof and above. Would everyone stand, please? And they drew out of the staves of the ark that the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracles, and they were not seen without. And there it is unto this day. There was nothing in the ark save two tables which Moses put therein at Horeb. When the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them, Esther, Herman of Judah, with the law, with the sons and the brethren, being assayed in white linen, having cymbals and psaltery and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounding with the trumpets. 
And he came, and it came even to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were one, to make one sound to be heard in the praising and thanking the Lord. And when, the, and when they had lifted up their voices with the trumpets, with the cymbals and the instruments and the muskets, and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. God richest blessings upon his work. Then said Solomon, The Lord has said, We would dwell in the thickness of the darkness, but I have built him a house. As we solemnly look to the word of the living God, and speaking on the subject of dedication of building to the Lord, I would like to make this statement, that it is known among most of us, and especially among scholars, that God is ominous present. Well, I believe in a measure that God is ominous present. God is omnipresent, him being omniscient makes him omnipresent. If God is omnipresent, just like the atmosphere, then he is a myth. But God is a person. Amen. Therefore, he has to have a certain place that he dwells. And he is omnipresent present by being omnipresent. mission. Therefore, if he is everywhere because being omnipresent, he knows everything. Therefore, if he knows everything, he knows what's going on at every place. But God himself dwells in a certain place. Therefore, he can be infinite. Now, the word infinite could not be broken down into any word by any language. The word infinite is like infinite. It's from there on. And God is infinite. And if I would try to make one quotation what infinite means, that would be that a hundred million years before the world was ever found, the infinite God knew every flea that would ever be on the earth and knows every time that he had bat his eyes, each of them. That doesn't even start half of what it means to be infinite. Therefore, God being infinite and on mission, he knows all things and he knows everything that's going on at all places at all times. But he himself is a person dwelling in one place. Therefore, he could, we could call him on this mission. Now God dwells among his people. And as he called them out of Egypt, they were the people of God. He chose them as a nation, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. And he chose this certain people that as long as they were dwelling in Egypt and scattered, they were the people of God. But when he called them out, they were then the church of God. Because the word church means separated, called out. They become the church of God. Then being the church of God, God has gained a certain place for these people to meet him where there would be fellowship. Because God longs to fellowship with his people and among his people. Then God took Moses up into the mountain of fire where the lightnings were flashing and the thunders were roaring. And he showed him what kind of a dwelling place he desired to dwell in on earth. 
For Moses sat in the earthly tabernacle after what he had seen in heaven, a sanctuary of the Lord. Oh, I think that's so beautiful. To think that God, before he would let a church building be built, that that building had to be a pattern of his heavenly abode. Moses made all things after the pattern of the heavenly. And now let us take just a little look at this. What Moses must have saw. And he made it first out of earthly material, which was made of skin, sheep skin. We would call it a tabernacle or a tent, means a dwelling place. And in this tabernacle or tent, there were three separate compartments. That surely is the way it is in glory. And we noticed one was called the court, or the congregational place. The next was called the holy place. And the next was called the holy of holy. All these pointed to Christ. And even the furniture that was in the inside its walls, everything spoke of Christ. That's the reason that in Christ dwells the fullness of God. Because all things led to Him. And Christ was God, made flesh, God tabernacling on earth. Therefore, it was said by uh, Stephen that Solomon built him a temple, but the uh, most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, but a body has thou made me. All the furniture in the building typed Christ, such as the laver where the sacrifice was washed, the brass altar where it was slain and burned. And the brass, even in the altar, speaks of judgment, divine judgment. Brass, like the brass serpent was made in the wilderness, speaking of the divine judgment of God upon the serpent made of brass, past judgment. When Elijah went up to look and said the skies was like brass, divine judgment upon a sinful nation. Brass speaks of judgment. The serpent itself on the pole spoke of judgment past. God's divine judgment on the serpent. And spoke of the coming of Christ where he would be made sin and God's divine judgment would be poured out on him. That he being man and God would have to come down made lower than the angels, so that he might die for the sins of us all. His soul could not die because he was God. But his body had to be made a body of flesh so that it could die to be a sacrifice, virgin born body, die for a sacrifice, that we sinful people might be brought nigh unto God by believing on this. Then we notice also that God dwelling in a three-room house, and that's the house that you dwell in. No person can dwell in any more than three rooms. Sometimes I'm amazed at going and seeing houses with 21 rooms in it, 15 rooms, but you only live in three. That is the kitchen, the parlor, and the bedroom. You may have three bedrooms. You may have sun porches. But there is really only three. You may have a dining room, but that's just an off-breed from the kitchen. Kitchen where you eat, the parlor where you fellowship, and the bedroom where you rest. And it speaks of God's order of his church. We come into the kitchen by hearing the word and eating the good things of God. That's justification. Then we come into sanctification where we have fellowship, one with the other, by the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son cleanses us from all sin. 
And then we have the place of rest and security when we're baptized with the Holy Ghost. Justification by faith, sanctification by the blood, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First John 5, 7 said, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, which is the Son, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. There are three that bear record in earth, the water, the blood, and the Spirit, and these three agree in one. You cannot have the Father without the Son. You cannot have the Holy Ghost without having both Father and Son. But you can be justified without being sanctified, and you can be sanctified without having the Holy Ghost. They agree in one. The Father, Son, Holy Ghost are one. You can be in one court justified by faith believing. You can be in another cleaned up from a life of sin and sanctified. Now, as it is in the natural, so is it in the spiritual. When a woman brings forth a baby, the first thing comes is water. The second thing comes is blood. The third thing comes is life. And when Jesus died at the cross, the elements came from his body to cleanse his church and to bring it into himself. When they speared his side, there was water, blood, and into the hands I command my spirit. That's how about one spirit we are all baptized into one body and are at rest. Oh, what can the world do? I'm so glad God got a hold of me before the church did, with all of its doctrines. I found a resting place. Oh, that sweet abiding place. For there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus has found that eternal rest. Paul said in Hebrews, explaining the Sabbath, that there was a time that God entered into rest on the Sabbath day, and he said again he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, when you hear my voice, harden not your heart. And Isaiah in the 28th chapter, he said, For precept must be upon precept and line upon line. Your little and their little, hold fast to that which is good, there with stammering lips and other tongues will I speak to this people. And this is the rest. Oh, that perfect rest to come from the congregation to the altar, from the altar to the bosom of Christ. The bed, the night, the secret place, the resting place. Justification, Martin Luther taught it. Sanctification, John Wesley taught it. Now the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Pentecost taught it by the Holy Spirit. Enter into our everlasting eternal rest. And as long as you are in that room, you are hid away in the holies of holies with God. And you are in the church of the firstborn. You are baptized into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you are free from judgment. For you have passed through the blood and when I see the blood I pass over you. And Christ took your judgment, and you'll never have to go through the judgment that you pass from death unto life. So to enter into the true abiding place of God is by spiritual baptism. What is it? The congregation. The sinner comes in and hears. That's where he's eating. How he learns that Jesus died in his stead. He being a guilty sinner, subject to death and duly deserves death. But when he hears faith cometh by hearing, then he rises to his feet and makes a testimony that he is not fit, but that he does believe and expect the death of the Lord Jesus that he suffered and he did. And that Jesus atoned for his sins and he's accepting it by faith through the word. 
and he has going to change his life from this on and live right. Yet in that heart still desires the root of evil to do wrong because the tree's just cut down. He can only be forgiven for what he's done. Not what Adam done, what he done. The sins that he did. He can ask forgiveness for what he did, but he cannot ask forgiveness for what Adam done. Then the blood of Jesus Christ through sanctification comes in and cleanses that heart from all sin and roots out every element of sin. The word sanctify people stammer at it. But it's a Greek compound word which means being cleaned and set aside for service. The altar sanctified the vessel and cleansed it and it was set aside for service. But being set aside for service isn't in service yet. But when the Holy Spirit comes to this sanctified vessel, it fills it and puts it into service of the Lord. Three-room house. You yourself are abiding in a three-room house. You are soul, body, and spirit. You are three compartments. God dwells in three. God is perfected in three. The church is perfected in three. The mathematics of the Bible does not fail. The sevens in worship, the twenty-fours, the temptations and forty in the jubilees and fifties, the mathematics of the Bible run perfect. God is perfect in three. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost makes the one perfect God, three offices of the same God. The church is perfected through justification, sanctification, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then you are sealed until the day of your redemption. And he that once purged by the blood of Jesus Christ has no more desire of sin. You've passed from death unto life. Or if we didn't have so much mockery of it these days, you'd find a real church sanctified by the power of the Holy Ghost and fellowship. That would be beyond any human thinking. But we have impersonators that go in and claim that they've done it. Many times they shout and speak with tongues to show some outward emotion. But Brother Jesus said, By their feet you shall know them. Thorns and thistles grow up with the wheat, but you know them by their fruit. You shall not pull them up, but let them grow together, and the angels of the harvest will separate them. The three-room house, a three-compartment service. One is your body, what you do for Christ. The other is your spirit, what you think of Christ. The other is your soul, the faith that you have in Christ. Three-room house. Completely, absolutely dedicated to the service of the living God. Justification by faith. Sanctification by the blood. The filling of the Holy Spirit entering into peace and rest with God. No wonder we have so much backsliding. No wonder we have so much troubles in the churches today because they don't come all the way with God to the enter into that place where it's dead. Man dies out to his own intellectual thinking. Remember a little seed, it cannot bear any life until it is rotten. But a grain of corn in the ground, just as yellow as it can be hard and taste. But until that corn dies and rots to its own body, it'll never bring forth another sprout. And when the new life comes in, it's absolutely altogether different from the first life. It's soft and flexible. And life, it comes from that little grain of life that's cased in the outside. So is a man or a woman that's born with the Spirit of God. You may be ever so brilliant intellectually, but now you are born again and your intellectuals has rotten away from your thoughts and you hold only to Christ and He's filled you with His Spirit. That's when the things of the world become foolish to you. And the love of God is great and first in your life. There you are, Moses, or Aaron, and the prophets, and so forth. I believe today that no preacher has a right to preach the gospel until he's come into this holy place. That's where the miracles come place. No one of the church natural today can't believe in miracles. They've never come into the miracle working place where they're at rest with God. There's where Aaron's rod bedded. Something that was dead, an old dry stick off the desert, in that holy of holies, tucked new life and bloom, blooms and sprouted out and brought leaves. Why, it was laying in the holiest of holy. 
You can take a dead sinner, rotten, a carnal in his mind, and in his thinking, you're a criticizer of the power of God and bring him into the presence of the Holy Ghost. There'll be something happen to him. Sure. Entering into that lonely place with God, he dwells, said Moses, in the next chapter, in the thickness of the darkness. That's where God dwells. That's where life stays. It's in the midst of the rotten corruption. Where does the life stay? In a seed after it's rotten. When it dies to itself, it brings forth a new life. Where does God stay? He'll stay with you if you are ready to die out to yourself. And give him a chance. Service, body, intellectual, spirit, thoughts. And so your faith in God. Three room house. Now there was an approach to this house as Moses made it. And now notice what kind of approach it was. Before you could ever enter into that building, you had to be prepared before you entered into the worship. Now we find over in the scriptures that when God was making a way for the people to come to this building to worship him, God said, take me a heifer that's red, that never a yoke has ever been upon her heifer, and she must be red, scarlet. Red speaks of redemption, blood, red. That's the reason our sins are red. That's the reason the blood of Christ is red. You take a red piece of glass and look at a red piece of glass and see what color you get. Red through red looks white. Though our sins be a scar when God looks to them through the blood of his son, they are white as snow. Red. Redemption. Red to red looks white. When God looks to the blood of his son that you confess to be your savior, he doesn't see your sins anymore. They are white as snow. Red to red. And he said, take a red heifer. Again, the type of Christ. He wanted to make the waters of separation for the unbeliever. And he said, take this heifer where never a yoke has been upon her neck. It speaks of not being yoked up with anything. Trouble of it is today that we try to yoke up with everything. The church and the denominations are trying to yoke up with the world. But the power of God is not yoked to nobody but God. No denomination can say, I have it. God has it. No church, no denomination, no certain man, no creed. But God has it. Yoke yourself not up with unbelievers that come out from among them. Be yoked with God. Take my yoke upon you, said Jesus, and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly. And you'll find rest to your souls. Yoked up with nothing. Never a yoke upon its neck. And this heifer was to be killed by the high priest. And it was Caiaphas as the high priest who witnessed the death of the Lord Jesus and it was to be killed before the whole congregation of Israel. And Israel was the one who condemned Jesus and witnessed his death, yoked up with the unbelief of the world. Notice, then this heifer was to be burned. Her hoofs, her head, her horns, the dung in the heifer, everything was to be burned. And in the burning there was to be put scarlet, cedar wood, and hyssop. Now, the sparrow in the Bible is referred to as sheep's wool dyed in blood. Scarlet, the red meaning of redemption. That scarlet wool was to be thrown in with the heifer. And then cedar wood speaks of the cross. The cross cedar wood is white and got red streaks in it. And the white speaks of the righteousness of the cross. And the red speaks of the blood that made it righteous. The cross was a curse. Cursed is he that hangeth on a tree. The cross was a curse until the blood of Jesus Christ poured down it. Then we embrace it to our hearts. For it's the righteousness of God. It was the red that's in the cedar wood that makes the white righteous. Cedar wood should be burnt with it. Then hyssop would be thrown in with the scarlet. Cedar wood and hyssop. Hyssop is nothing but common weed. 
Meaning that the gospel must never be taught by Dr. PhDs. It must be taught in humility. Just as humble as a weed is before you. The gospel's never to be made complicated to the people. It's to be humble. It was the hossip that they dipped in the Lamb's blood that went over the lintel of the doorpost in Israel. Hossip, weeds, just common weeds, making the humility of the gospel, of the waters of separation, because the waters of separation is the word of the living God. They were to be burned together, the heifer, the scarlet, the cedar wood, and the hossip, all burnt together, and the ashes was to be kept in the outer court by in a holy place. God let this saint deep in the heart. The word of God has no right to be preached out of an unholy mouth. It should not be preached out of the mouth of a man that would say that Jesus Christ is once one thing and now something else. It must be preached by a power of the living God who sanctified lips that dedicated to the service of the Lord. Let these ashes the waters of separation be kept in a holy place. No believer that ever takes on the name of the Lord Jesus that ever confesses him as Savior should ever do anything of the world. If he does, he should repent of it quickly. Because then words of the waters of separation must be kept in a holy place. Handle with clean hands. No man has a right to preach the gospel without first being sanctified from the cares and things of this world. The waters of separation. What did it do? When the unbeliever, one born in Israel, had wandered away, or a stranger came into the church, the first thing happened in the outside, in the course where the meat was served, where the word was preached, the man with a clean heart and with clean hands Islands of God, the burning of the heifer, the cedar wood and the hossip, taken and sprinkled this man with the waters of separation. The preacher should have a clean, pure, unadulterated heart. His hands should be undefiled from the things of the world that preaches the word is kept in a holy place and ministered with holy hands. Ephesians, the sixth chapter says that we are washed by the water of the Word. Separation. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word. What are we doing? We're entering to this building. We're six to ten. But before anyone can come in that's been an alien, that's away from God, that's once been in that city, or has gone out into the world, or one who is born outside of Israel must first come and be sprinkled with the waters of separation, separating him from the things of the world, that his desire and love and desire is for the word of God. He counts it greater than anything else. Then what did they do with the blood of the heifer? They took the blood of the heifer and caught it in a charger, went to the doors of the tabernacle, and there they smeared seven stripes across the door. Then when this worshiper, our sprinkled one, separated one from the things of the world that's coming now, must as he enters into the door to look at the blood, not to a creed, not to a denomination, but to the blood of the dead sacrifice. You must remember, and seven times this was sprinkled, which means all 7,000 years that human beings will exist upon the earth because the blood has been and will be the only grounds of fellowship that God will ever meet man on. The fellowship of the blood. You're coming from the courts now into the fellowship. Before you can ever come into the fellowship of the believers, you must be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. No matter how well you know the Bible, how well it's been explained to you, you must recognize the blood of the Lord Jesus and be cleansed and sanctified from your worldly habits, smoking, drinking, gambling, you women wearing immoral clothes, you deacons and so forth, and church members drinking, smoking cigarettes, playing cards, running pool rooms. That's the things of the world. 
And you've got to be separated from that. There's only one thing can do it. A change your nature. And the blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can do it. Okay. You must recognize the blood for every generation. From the very day in the Garden of Eden that sin was committed, God made a preparation to fellowship with man again. That was through the blood. I don't care how good your church is, how much denomination you've got, how well you are prepared, how much you've shouted, what you've spoken come. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ that separates you from the things of the world. What are we doing? We're coming into that first temple that was dedicated. What was it? Hear the word first. Then come and recognize the blood. Yes, people say today sanctification. Oh, Fogey, sanctifying needs to be clean. And a man that can't recognize the blood of Jesus Christ that cleans him from his sins will never be able to fellowship with the true church of the living God. You can't do it. I don't mean denominational churches of the living God. We have plenty of them. Four or five different denominations which they're just as good as the rest of them. But all together is condemned. Name makes nothing until the blood applies. Oh, precious is the pearl that makes us white as snow. No other phantom knows nothing but the blood of Jesus. No denomination, no church, no building, no barrier, no nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's the only fountain I know for cleansing. And every fellow that comes to worship God must first be recognized that there was a sacrifice who died and his blood was shed that you might enter into this fellowship and accept it. What I was trying to say last night about people who's born to the Spirit of God, no wonder they don't see the things of the world because they're from another world. Their spirit comes from above where holiness and righteousness dwells. Where the blood of Jesus on his bloody garments hangs before God day. Angels bow before it. Everything in the heaven bows to it. And everything on earth that ever goes to heaven will bow to it. We must all recognize the blood as we come beneath those seven sights. A blood the worshippers coming in now for fellowship. Oh, some people go out and hear the word. They go to a seminary. They think they learn all the teaching of the church. They think they got a right to preach, but they haven't got a right to preach until they've recognized the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansing them from their preachers going down the street, their collars turned around with a cigarette in their mouth. Others getting out here on bathing beaches and everything else in the land, but their congregations having bunk hole games and parties in the church. And calling it preachers. No, sir, it's man made preachers. God called preachers. Come to the blood. Don't carry your uh, denomination, baby, as old as the country is. But the blood was the first thing God recognized. It was his only preparation for the cleansing of the soul. And it's the only thing that God will recognize, and the only thing that God will fellowship that is them that's under the blood. For when I see the blood, I'll pass, I'll pass over you. Only through the blood. A man must recognize that. What's he doing coming into these three rooms now? He comes in to worship. First when he gets in there, there's three in there. Out here there's three stages to get to it. The first is to the separation. Water by the washing of the word. Second, recognizing the blood that he's passing under. Then when he comes in beneath the blood, he comes into the fellowship of all the saints. He's baptized into that body by the Spirit of that one who died that smeared the blood mark over the door. Then he is sanctified and then filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized into the body of the believer. That's where God meets under the shed blood. That's where God met in the first tabernacle. That's where God meets in the second tabernacle. That's what this tabernacle is built here for this morning. What is it? That is the congregation, the courts. Here is the holy place, the altar, and here is where the preacher stands. The holiest of holies, where the word is ministered to the people. And to come into the holiest of holies, no man has the right to preach it out. He's been in there. Now when he gets into this place, when he comes and recognizes the word, Wash for the water of the word. Next he recognizes the blood, he's sanctified. Then he's brought into the fellowship of the believers and with God. Then in this tabernacle. Oh, I feel good. Real religious. In this tabernacle was the high priest Aaron. 
Oma. In the fellowship after he went into it, he was anointed. The anointed high priest. David said, How sweet it is for our brethren to dwell together in unity. It is likened to the precious anointing oil that they poured on Aaron's head that run all the way down to the hems of his skirt. This anointing oil represents the Holy Spirit. Aaron was a high priest, a type of Christ. And notice that anointing oil had in it the perfume of the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. The rose of Sharon, that beautiful big red flower who stands in its beauty, who represents Christ. Perfume can never be brought from the star until that flower is crushed and mashed and squeezed out of it the perfume to be a sweet-smelling Savior unto the Lord. And the great, beautiful life that our Lord lived was instrumental in God's hand, but it could never be a perfume until he was crushed and mashed and spit on and squeezed the very life out of him at Calvary. That made the anointing for us. He was the lily of the valley. What do you get out of lilies? Opium. What does opium do? It soothes pain. It puts you to sleep in a dream land. What does the Holy Spirit do? The opium of the Holy Spirit eases every pain. Takes away every tear, means every heartache. The lily of the valley. And what is the high priest in all of it? Both for salvation and for healing. What is it? The bright morning star that shines forth as a light in darkness. Abraham had the oath confirmed to him as a little light went between those dark horrors and the sacrifices. The lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, the rose of Sharon, the fairest of ten thousands to my soul. The minister then is standing as a high priest to take the place of Aaron must be anointed with fellowship. He cannot draw a denominational barrier in the house of God. You cannot say this, this church belongs to the Presbyterians, this place belongs to the Methodists or the Baptists or the Pentecostals or whatever it may. It must be an open house for every man that's been separated from his sins and filled with the Spirit can have the gladness of the fellowship of the oil of the Lord. Oh, what a place to worship. Running all the way down in every denomination, every brother, that's born of the Spirit freely coming into the house. Aaron standing anointed. Jesus stands the anointed one this morning to fellowship with you, Church of God, you Presbyterian, you Methodist, you Baptist, whoever that's come by the waters of separation and recognize the blood and been sanctified and baptized into the body. I don't care what brand that you have. You're son and daughter of God and have a right to this fellowship. Because you've come through, the nominational bearers will stop you, but the Holy Spirit will bring you into that fellowship. That's of God. What have we done? That's the order of the first tabernacle. If that isn't the order of this tabernacle, it will perish and fail. Right. You built it in vain. You people who sacrificed your living to build this beautiful structure, which is, I want to get the pattern of this. We're fixing to build one in Jeffersondale. I like this. I love your pastor. I love you. But brother, there is the honor of the house of the Lord. It's a temple that's dedicated. That was in the shadow. Moses saw it. Then one day David was sitting with the prophet. And he said to the prophet Nathan, he said, is it right? that I myself live in a house of cedar and the ark of the covenant of my God is under them tents out under yet. And Nathan, being a prophet, know that David was right with God. He said, David, do all that's in your heart for God is with you. And David desired to build him a house. But that night, God seen the motive of the prophet, seen the motive of the king and their objective. He said, go tell my servant David, who has him? I took him out of a sheep coat from far enough to sheep. What did he take you people from? And I made him a name, a great name. When the Lord showed me that one day, I thought, oh God, what could I be? A poor little preacher back there 
لمن له نومه این جبش می بیان اما دهی به مکهی روها چند نتی می هند فرست تایم ایلی برو رید ایت 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 But I just can't let you build the temple because I'm going to let your son build it. Or it was in types and shadows, Solomon building the temple. But the true son of David is Jesus Christ that built the real temple that was born the virgin birth and in his body is the everlasting temple of God. But in types and in dedication, Solomon built the temple. Remember, it was cut out of every different kind of stone. It was cut this way and that way. And for 40 years in his structure, there was not heard the buzz of a saw or the pounding of a hammer. It was so perfectly cut out. Now one stone different from the other. A new denomination of people here this morning, Church of God, and two or three different denominations of you, and all you Pentecostals, and the oneness and the two-ness and the three-ness and whatever you may be. Do you realize that God's doing that for a purpose? The stones were cut out different from different parts of the world. But when they come together, there wasn't a buzz of a saw or a sound of a hammer. Someday the chief architect will come and the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, all you oneness to this three this churches of God, Pentecostal assemblies, will come together without a murmur. Yes. You'll sit joint by joint. Oh, be anointed. The high priest is anointed. Let him be standing always in this building anointed to reach out a hand, shake to any man that's born of the Spirit of God. No matter what church he belongs to, he's your brother. That's your sister. When you draw a denominational bear, God will lead this tabernacle. And you can't recognize all the body of the Lord Jesus. For he died that we all could be saved. Yes. And God's doing this for a purpose. Remember the cedars was cut out in Lebanon, floated to Joppa, hauled from Joppa by ox carts to Jerusalem. The tall cedars of Lebanon, which is overlaid with gold in the temple, there wasn't a sound of a saw nowhere. Here's one thing that they did, and that's one thing the church is doing today in the erection of the first tabernacle stationarily, from being a tent to go from place to place. It was this. They found out they started the building and they went so far and they found out they found a funny looking stone. It was an odd stone. It didn't look like the rest of the stone. And they rejected it and threw it over in the lean pile. They said that stone won't fit in this building. And they kicked it out into the weed pile. But as they kept coming up to a certain place, they kept laying in a place. After a while they had a hole in the building. And they couldn't have nothing to fit it. That's where you churches have got today. You denominations. You built and you plastered and you got buildings, but you found there's a hell in there somewhere. What did they find? The stone that was rejected from Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Certainly you made denominations. We have it. The rest of it is not in it. You're leaving out the love of God, the chief cornerstone. I don't care how many miracles you can perform, how many prophets you have, how many works of grace you do. It'll never meet or never do anything because the church of the living God is married together and cemented by love. And they've rejected that stone. Like Elijah in the cave. He heard first go by a great thunder and roar. Then he heard a lot of lightning. Then he had a rushing wind. But God was not in all of it. I think that's what we've done today. We've had fire and blood and smoke and rushing winds. We've listened so much to rushing mighty winds, I wonder if we hadn't refused to hear the still small voice. Let it not be so with this tabernacle. May it stand still. Listen for God. For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their faith. They shall mount up with the wings of an eagle. They'll run and not be weary. That's frustrating. They're walking out saying, Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, how to wait. Sure. There they had it. Rejected stone. Become the chief of the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. That's where it said when they rightly went and got this rejected stone. 
and pressed it in, it fit perfectly. And the building was assembled together. Then when the building was assembled together and all completed, Solomon called the day of dedication. That tabernacle was built just exactly like this year. The congregation, the court, the altar, and the holiest of holies. But look at the principles they had to come to. Look what they had to stand for. Look how they had to have this common place of fellowship. Let this tabernacle always stand by those principles, which was in type then, now it's antitype. Or then the order of dead beasts sprinkled the mercy seat, but now the blood of Jesus Christ sprinkles the mercy seat. And as we come in, we must recognize the blood and the healing of the, God, of the power of God. We must recognize the full gospel. We must have fellowship with every brother or sister that desires fellowship that's come to the same elements that we have. Never let his denomination stand in the way. This church will stand to the coming of the Lord again. For I believe it's soon at hand. But after the ark was brought in, and the waters of separation was placed in the court, the blood was cut stripes over the door from the killing of the red heifer. When everything was in order, Solomon called the people together. As your pastor has called you this morning, oh, it was a real time of dedication and of fellowship. In closing, I want to say this. They call them together, and when the people come in to see that God finally had a place that he would meet them, the appropriation of his gospel was made clear. The way of approach was made clear. Everything was made right. Look, they called out the sons of the different instrument players, and they went down to the east side of the altar. They were dressed in white, and they sang the songs with joy. The people praised God to the prayer like one voice. If that ain't really cause I've never seen it in all my life, when it's in His power and His holiness, the temple was ready to be dedicated. How are you ready this morning for dedication? Remember, not only did Israel be ready for dedication as a temple, but they were dedicating themselves to God again, for they had come in. The Pentecostal church today and this pastor here, I believe with my heart, is a man of God. I believe that he stands for the principles that God has laid out to us. So you see, the dedication of a church don't only mean coming and saying, Lord, we give you this building, but it means, Lord, we give ourselves to you in sacrifice. Amen. There is no lily on the altar that God wants every Easter morning. It's the sinner on the altar. It's not the Christ and the beauty of the building, which is fine. Solomon's temple was the same. But it's coming under the articles of God, coming self-sacrifice to the service of God. And when Israel had finally made one place that they could all dwell in, come to a place to meet God under the fellowship of the blood, then they begin to sing with joy. They begin to play the harp. They praise God in such one accord until it's not like one voice to sing. Then Solomon stood to pray and to make the dedication to the Lord. And when he did that, remember, the ark had already been brought in under the wings of the cherubim and set back in the holy place. But when the people dedicated, not the church, not the building, but when the people got with one accord and prayed with one accord and sang with one accord, and everything was of one accord, then the Holy Spirit in the form of a pillar of fire moved into the building and settled up on the place and it was so much glory in that building until the priest could not minister anymore. God let it be again. Let it come again to this little tabernacle. We walk through the blood uh, under the blood of the Lord Jesus confessing our sins and be filled with His Spirit and come here and you people this morning should be just as glad and happy of this little tabernacle as Israel was of theirs. Come under the same order that they come and happiness will come to your heart. Bear in your heart that you'll never condemn any man that's born to the Spirit. That you'll have fellowship with all His servants, with all of His people, made to stand as an interdenominational institution, made to stand to a place that the wayfaring may come by, May it be a place of house by the side of the road. May it be a place where the pilgrim, the wayfaring man, can find rest as he enters his door. May its pastor live to see the coming of the Lord. 
May the congregation grow and prosper in all that you do. May God's blessings rest upon us. And he who made me a minister by his grace, I pronounce this blessing to this little church as long as Thomas, if it will stay under the order of God, it shall remain. But if it gets out of the order of God, anything can happen to it. Be sure that the blood is over the lintels of each door of your heart, over the lintels of the door there, that there's no denominational barriers, there's no difference. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. Let it be for whosoever will may come and fellowship. Yeah. Never fail to preach the full gospel from this holy sanctuary. Yeah. May it be that this place here will always have miracles and signs and wonders of the resurrected Jesus. May the anointed high priest with all of the opium to soothe ever a broken heart. May the rose of sharing the sweetness of the Spirit are so richly with the anointing oil so be preached here and demonstrated here to a man from all parts of the country will come in and say, Truly, God is with you. May signs and wonders accompany the preaching of our brother. And if he shall go somewhere else or pass on, may the one who follows him walk into this building as it has been down through the years since Sam Jones and them. May this Holy Ghost gospel never fail to be preached here. May it never compromise or draw boundary lines through any denomination. May it always be open to whosoever will. Let him come and drink from the fountains of the Lord. While we pray, as Solomon did the dedication prayer, may the congregation stand with their hands and pray in your own way. And thank God for this tabernacle and for a place of worship that the Lord our God has found the place at last that he can place his name and under the blood and the fellowship of the Spirit. Let every person raise your head now, and in your own way, let us dedicate ourselves with this temple to the glory of God. Almighty God, we come into thy presence, praying to be the works of the hands of the children of man, this tabernacle that tears and sacrifice and labors has brought its material, careful hands has designed it and made it a place and upon their hearts was the same burden that was on David's heart. It's not right for us to worship in this old dilapidated shack when many of us live and good homes. Oh Lord God, let it be so that the same Holy Ghost and the same articles of God will be preached in the antitype now in this tabernacle. May the Holy Spirit move today and come into the doorway and settle upon everyone. May the power of the living God be in this tabernacle. May it always stand to the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we commit it to you, the works of the hand, the labor, the toils, the cares. And Lord, may it not be in vain, but may people realize this dedicated message this morning to you in the dedication of the tabernacle. May it be, Lord, that your spirit will come into this place. May every man or woman that's out of Christ, when it walks to that door, may it recognize that it's coming under the blood. May there be such a feeling here of the blessedness of Christ, the sweetness of the Spirit, until men and women will flow from all parts of the city and around about to hear the gospel from here. May this congregation so be seasoned and salted with the baptism of the Holy Ghost until they'll be called the salt of the earth. Grant it, Lord. Hear our prayers this morning. Not only do we give you this tabernacle, but we give ourselves to you in service for this tabernacle and for the cause in which it stands for. Oh, God, receive us this morning. We are your children. We stand here this morning to our feet, our hands up, our eyes looking up, because we believe that the Holy Spirit is present. Hear us, Lord, and receive our prayer, and receive our commemorations of your goodness, the works of our hands as we present it to you. May the power of God take our sacrifice and take us with it and dedicate both tabernacle and congregation to the kingdom of God and the work of his Son. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name as we give it to you. Amen. You may be seated. This tabernacle now belongs to God Almighty. You belong to God Almighty. Always keep yourself clean. Keep your church clean. Keep it upright so that any who travels by might love to come in and fellowship with you. Have such a sweet spirit that you can reach out a hand to anyone and offer them help. No matter how far they are down in the gutter, that's what this stands for. A shrine of the grace of God. It's your